สวัสดีครับสวัสดีตอนบ่ายสวัสดีตอนเย็นและ Good afternoon t e a c h e r Dodo <laughs> ใครเข้ามา r a d a r s p e r b u n นะครับอ่ะไม่เป็นไรเป็นไงบ้าง r a d a r Happy ไหมช่วงนี้ดีครับจริงบ้าที่โรงเรียนเป็นไงปิดเทอมหรือยังเพิ่งเปิดเทอมครับอ๋อเพิ่งเปิดเทอมโอเคก็ตามนี้นะฮะอ่ะเริ่มที่สิบสิบเอ็ดสิบสองสิบสามสิบสี่และสิบห้าเลือกเลือกใหม่ครับชอบเลขไหนเอาสิบสี่อันสองครับเพราะว่าอันนี้ทำหมดแล้วครับอยู่ทำไปหมดแล้วเหรอไอ้ก็ไม่มีอะไรจะให้ทำแล้วนะถ้าอย่างนั้นนะโอเคโอเคอ่าไม่ว่ากันทีนี้แบบหนึ่งตั้งใจฟังดีๆนะครับน่าจะได้คอนเซปต์แล้วนะครับก็คือเน้นทสเน้นเป็นพาร์ทวันพาร์ททูนะครับเอ้ยแต่ว่ารอบนี้เคลียร์ไปนะเคลียร์ปะทำไมรู้สึกว่า HD เวอร์เวอร์มีภาพภาพเคลียร์นะดิสิตเลยครับแป๊บหนึ่งขอดูก่อน Quality ขอเป็น720คลิกเคลียร์ได้อะก็ตามนี้ก่อนแล้วกันนะครับอ่ะสองเวอร์ชันนะครับพร้อมแล้วอ่ะลองทำดูก่อนแล้วกันนะครับ40ข้อทำให้เต็มที่นะครับ one two three go you will hear a number of different recordings and you will have to answer questions on what you hear there will be time for you to read the instructions and questions and you will have a chance to check your work All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four sections. At the end of the test, you will be given 10 minutes to transfer your answers to an answer sheet. Now turn to section one. Section one. You will hear a woman talking to a doctor at a clinic about a medical problem. First, you have some time to look at questions one to four. You will see that there is an example that has been done for you. On this occasion only, the conversation relating to this will be played first. Hi, come and take a seat. Thank you. My name's Carl Rogers, and I'm one of the doctors here at the Total Health Clinic. So I understand this is your first visit to the clinic. Yes, it is. Okay. Well, I hope you'll be very happy with the service you receive here. So if it's all right with you, I'll take a few details to help me give you the best possible service. Sure. So can I check first of all that we have the correct personal details for you? So your full name is Julie Ann Garcia. That's correct. The woman's name is Julie Ann Garcia. So Garcia has been written in the space. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to four. Hi, come and take a seat. Thank you. My name's Carl Rogers, and I'm one of the doctors here at the Total Health Clinic. So I understand this is your first visit to the clinic. Yes, it is. Okay. Well, I hope you'll be very happy with the service you receive here. So if it's all right with you, I'll take a few details to help me give you the best possible service. Sure. So can I check first of all that we have the correct personal details for you? So your full name is Julie Ann Garcia. That's correct. Perfect. And can I have a contact phone number? It's two one nine four four two nine seven eight five. Okay. And then can I just check that we have the correct date of birth? October tenth, nineteen ninety two. Oh, I actually have 1991. I'll just correct that now. 
Right, so that's all good. Now, I just need a few more personal details. Do you have an occupation, either full-time or part-time? Uh, yes, I work full-time in Esterhazy's, you know, the restaurant chain. I started off as a waitress there a few years ago, and I'm a manager now. Oh, I know them. Yeah, they're down on 114th Street, aren't they? Uh, that's right. Yeah, I've been there a few times. I just love their salads. <laughs> that's good to hear. Right, so one more thing I need to know before we talk about why you're here, Julie. And that's the name of your insurance company. It's Cawley Life Insurance. That's C-A-W-L-E-Y. Excellent. Thank you so much. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 5 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 5 to 10. Now, Julie, let's look at how we can help you. So tell me a little about what brought you here today. Well, I've been getting a pain in my knee, the left one. Not very serious at first, but it's gotten worse. So I thought I ought to see someone about it. That's certainly the right decision. So how long have you been aware of this pain? Is it just a few days or is it longer than that? longer. It's been worse for the last couple of days, but it's three weeks since I first noticed it. It came on quite gradually, though, so I kind of ignored it at first. And have you taken any medication yourself or treated it in any way? Um, yeah, I've been taking medication to deal with the pain, Tylenol, and that works okay for a few hours, but I don't like to keep taking it. Okay. And what about heat treatment? Have you tried applying heat at all? No, but I have been using ice on it for the last few days. And does that seem to help the pain at all? A little, yes. Good. Now, you look as if you're quite fit normally. I am, yes. So do you do any sport on a regular basis? Yes, I play a lot of tennis. I belong to a club, so I go there a lot. I'm quite competitive, so I enjoy that side of it as well as the exercise, but I haven't gone since this started. Sure. And do you do any other types of exercise? Uh, yeah, I sometimes do a little swimming, but usually just when I'm on vacation. But normally I go running a few times a week, maybe three or four times. Mm. So your legs are getting quite a pounding, but you haven't had any problems up to now? No, not with my legs. I did have an accident last year when I slipped and hurt my shoulder, but that's better now. Excellent. And do you have any allergies? No, none that I'm aware of. And do you take any medication on a regular basis? Well, I take vitamins, but that's all. I'm generally very healthy. Okay. Well, let's have a closer look and see what might be causing this problem. If you can just get up. That is the end of Section 1. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section two. Section two. You will hear a guide talking to a group of tourists who are about to visit an English castle. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. We'll be arriving at Branley Castle in about five minutes. But before we get there, I'll give you a little information about the castle and what our visit will include. So, in fact, there's been a castle on this site for over 1,100 years. The first building was a fort constructed in 914 AD for defence against Danish invaders by King Alfred the Great's daughter, who ruled England at the time. In the following century, after the Normans conquered England, the land was given to a nobleman called Richard de Vere, and he built a castle there that stayed in the de Vere family for over 400 years. However, when Queen Elizabeth I announced that she was going to visit the castle in 1576, it was beginning to look a bit run down. And it was decided that rather than repair the guest rooms, they'd make a new house for her out of wood next to the main hall. She stayed there for four nights, and apparently it was very luxurious, but unfortunately it was destroyed a few years later by fire. In the 17th century, the castle belonged to the wealthy Fennis family, who enlarged it and made it more comfortable. However, by 1982, the Fennis family could no longer afford to maintain the castle, even though they received government support, and they put it on the market. It was eventually taken over by a company who owned a number of amusement parks. But when we get there, I think you'll see that they've managed to retain the original atmosphere of the castle. When you go inside, you'll find that in the staterooms, there are lifelike moving wax models dressed in costumes of different periods in the past, which even carry on conversations together. As well as that, in every room, there are booklets giving information about what the room was used for and the history of the objects and furniture it contains. The castle park's quite extensive. At one time, sheep were kept there, and in the 19th century, the owners had a little zoo with animals like rabbits and even a baby elephant. Nowadays, the old zoo buildings are used for public displays of paintings and sculpture. The park also has some beautiful trees, Though the oldest of all, which dated back 800 years, was sadly blown down in 1987. Now, you're free to wander around on your own until 4.30. But then, at the end of our visit, we'll all meet together at the bottom of the Great Staircase. We'll then go on to the Long Gallery, where there's a wonderful collection of photographs showing the family who owned the castle 100 years ago having tea and cakes in the conservatory. And we'll then take you to the same place where afternoon tea will be served to you. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. Now, if you can take a look at your plans, you'll see Branley Castle has four towers joined together by a high wall with the river on two sides. Don't miss seeing the Great Hall. That's near the river in the main tower, the biggest one which was extended and redesigned in the 18th century. If you want to get a good view of the whole castle, you can walk around the walls. The starting point's quite near the main entrance. Walk straight down the path until you get to the south gate, and it's just there. Don't go on to the north gate. There's no way up from there. There'll shortly be a show in which you can see archers displaying their skill with a bow and arrow. The quickest way to get there is to take the first left after the main entrance and follow the path past the bridge. Then you'll see it in front of you at the end. If you like animals, there's also a display of hunting birds, falcons and eagles and so on. If you go from the main entrance 
in the direction of the south gate, but turn right before you get there instead of going through it. You'll see it on your right past the first tower. At 3 p.m., there's a short performance of traditional dancing on the outdoor stage. That's right at the other side of the castle from the entrance and over the bridge. It's about 10 minutes walk or so. And finally, the shop. It's actually inside one of the towers, but the way in is from the outside. Just take the first left after the main entrance, go down the path and take the first right. It's got some lovely gifts and souvenirs. Right, so we're just arriving. That is the end of section two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section three. Section three. You will hear two environmental science students called Rosie and Martin discussing their presentation on an extinct animal called the woolly mammoth with their tutor. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 24. So, Rosie and Martin, let's look at what you've got for your presentation on woolly mammoths. OK, we've got a short outline here. Thanks. Uh, so, it's about a research project in North America. Yes. But we thought we needed something general about woolly mammoths in our introduction to establish that they were related to our modern elephant and they lived thousands of years ago in the last ice age. Maybe we could show a video clip of a cartoon about mammoths, but that'd be a bit childish. Or we could have a diagram. It could be a timeline to show when they lived with illustrations. Or we could just show a drawing of them walking in the ice. No, let's go with your last suggestion. Good. Then you're describing the discovery of the mammoth tooth on St. Paul's Island in Alaska and why it was significant. Yes, the tooth was found by a man called Russell Graham. He picked it up from under a rock in a cave. He knew it was special. For a start, it was in really good condition, as if it had been just extracted from the animal's jawbone. Anyway, they found it was 6,500 years old. So why was that significant? Well, the mammoth bones previously found on the North American mainland were much less recent than that, so this was really amazing. Then we're making an animated diagram to show the geography of the area in prehistoric times. So originally, St. Paul's Island wasn't an island. It was connected to the mainland. And mammoths and other animals, like bears, were able to roam around the whole area. Then the climate warmed up and the sea level began to rise and the island got cut off from the mainland. So those mammoths on the island couldn't escape they had to stay on the island. And in fact, the species survived there for thousands of years after they'd become extinct on the mainland. So why do you think they died out on the mainland? 
No one's sure. Anyway, next we'll explain how Graham and his team identified the date when the mammoths became extinct on the island. They concluded that the extinction happened 5,600 years ago, which is a very precise time for a prehistoric extinction. It's based on samples they took from mud at the bottom of a lake on the island. They analysed it to find out what had fallen in over time. Bits of plants, volcanic ash, and even DNA from the mammoths themselves. It's standard procedure, but it took nearly two years to do. Before you hear the rest of the discussion, you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 25 to 30. So why don't you quickly go through the main sections of your presentation and discuss what actions needed for each part? OK, so for the introduction, we're using a visual. So once we've prepared that, we're done. I'm not sure. I think we need to write down all the ideas we want to include here. Not just rely on memory. How we begin the presentation is so important. Mm, you're right. The discovery of the mammoth tooth is probably the most dramatic part, but we don't have that much information, only what we got from the online article. I thought maybe we could get in touch with the researcher who led the team and ask him to tell us a bit more. Great idea. What about the section with the initial questions asked by the researchers? We've got a lot on that, but we need to make it interesting. We could ask the audience to suggest some questions about it and then see how many of them we can answer. I don't think it would take too long. Yes, that would add a bit of variety. Then the section on further research carried out on the island, analysing the mud in the lake. I wonder if we've actually got too much information here. Should we cut some? I don't think so, but it's all a bit muddled at present. Yes, maybe it would be better if it followed a chronological pattern. I think so. The findings and possible explanations section is just about ready, but we need to practice it so we're sure it won't overrun. I think it should be OK, but yes, <laughs> let's make sure. Hmm. In the last section, relevance to the present day, you've got some good ideas, but this is where you need to move away from the ideas of others and give your own viewpoint. OK, we'll think about that. Now, shall we show you some of the... That is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section four. Section four. You will hear a lecture about the history of weather forecasting. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. In this series of lectures about the history of weather forecasting, I'll start by examining its early history. That'll be the subject of today's talk. OK, so we'll start by going back thousands of years. Most ancient cultures had weather gods and weather catastrophes, such as floods, played an important role in many creation myths. Generally, weather was attributed to the whims of the gods, as the wide range of weather gods in various cultures shows. For instance, there's the Egyptian sun god Ra and Thor, the Norse god of thunder and lightning. Many ancient civilizations developed rites such as dances in order to make the weather gods look kindly on them. But the weather was of daily importance. Observing the skies and drawing the correct conclusions from these observations was really important. In fact, their survival depended on it. It isn't known when people first started to observe the skies, but at around 650 BC, the Babylonians produced the first short-range weather forecasts based on their observations of clouds and other phenomena. The Chinese also recognized weather patterns, and by 300 BC, astronomers had developed a calendar which divided the year into 24 festivals, each associated with a different weather phenomenon. The ancient Greeks were the first to develop a more scientific approach to explaining the weather. The work of the philosopher and scientist Aristotle in the 4th century BC is especially noteworthy as his ideas held sway for nearly 2,000 years. In 340 BC, he wrote a book in which he attempted to account for the formation of rain, clouds, wind, and storms. He also described celestial phenomena such as halos, that is, bright circles of light around the sun, the moon, and bright stars, and comets. Many of his observations were surprisingly accurate. For example, he believed that heat could cause water to evaporate, but he also jumped to quite a few wrong conclusions, such as that winds are breathed out by the earth. Errors like this were rectified from the Renaissance onwards. For nearly 2,000 years, Aristotle's work was accepted as the chief authority on weather theory. Alongside this, though, in the Middle Ages, weather observations were passed on in the form of proverbs, such as red sky at night, shepherd's delight, red sky in the morning, shepherd's warning. Many of these are based on very good observations and are accurate as contemporary meteorologists have discovered. For centuries, any attempt to forecast the weather could only be based on personal observations. But in the 15th century, scientists began to see the need for instruments. Until then, the only ones available were weather vanes to determine the wind direction and early versions of rain gauges. One of the first, invented in the 15th century, was a hygrometer, which measured humidity. This was one of many inventions that contributed to the development of weather forecasting. In 1592, the Italian scientist and inventor Galileo developed the world's first thermometer. His student Torricelli later invented the barometer, which allowed people to measure atmospheric pressure. In 1648, 
The French philosopher Pascal proved that pressure decreases with altitude. This discovery was verified by English astronomer Halley in 1686. And Halley was also the first person to map trade winds. This increasing ability to measure factors related to weather helped scientists to understand the atmosphere and its processes better. And they started collecting weather observation data systematically. In the 18th century, the scientist and politician Benjamin Franklin carried out work on electricity and lightning in particular. But he was also very interested in weather and studied it throughout most of his life. It was Franklin who discovered that storms generally travel from west to east. In addition to new meteorological instruments, other developments contributed to our understanding of the atmosphere. People in different locations began to keep records, and in the mid-19th century, the invention of the telegraph made it possible for these records to be collated. This led, by the end of the 19th century, to the first weather services. It was not until the early 20th century that mathematics and physics became part of meteorology. And we'll continue from that point next week. That is the end of section four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. เมื่อเปียกหอยยาวจริงป่ะผมลดค่าตอบได้ 10 ต้องมี TH นะ 10 ออกมาหรือว่า switch กันก็ได้ October 10 ก็ได้มั้งผมไม่เติมเอ็นนะครับตอบวิตามินอย่างเดียวไม่มีเอสต้องเติมเอชไม่ได้ถือว่าเอ่อถือว่าต้องเติมเอชนะเพราะว่า
ยี่สิบเอ็ดถึงอะไรนะครับเซกชันสามครับเดี๋ยวเดี๋ยวขอตรวจก่อนนะครับได้ครับเซกชันสามนะครับเซกชันสามผมหลุดข้อสามตีแล้วก็ผิดข้อสามห้าครับแค่สองข้อเซ็นเอ้เอ้เอ้อันนั้นเซ็กชันสี่ครับผิดแล้วเซ็กชันสามได้หมดเลยเหรอที่สูงทุกข้อเลยเหรอเดี๋ยวเดี๋ยวดูเซ็กชันสามหนึ่งครับสี่ first to four สามสิบห้าคอมเมดเซ็กชันสามผิดเยอะสุดแล้วใช่เซ็กชันสองกับสามนี่แหละที่มันเป็นตัวแบบดึงคะแนนยากนะครับเซ็กชันสองผมผิดข้อเดียวครับแต่ว่าเซ็กชันสามนี่ยแบบผิดไปประมาณหกข้อนะอันนี้ก็ฟังใหม่ใช่ไงแต่ว่ามันทริกกี้อยู่แล้วล่ะสามอ่ะเออเพราะว่ามันไม่ควรผิดเกินสองข้อไงถ้าสองข้อคือเราจะ play safe ถูกไหมแต่ถ้าเกิดว่ามากกว่าสี่ห้าข้อมันจะมีปัญหาเนี่ยเป็นว่าในแต่ละสิบข้อนะโอเคปะ่ะอืมทั้งหมดมันได้สามสิบเอ็ดนะครับเต็มสี่สิบเจ็ดจุดศูนย์ก็ไม่ได้ครับช่วงฝึกต้องอยู่ที่แปดเพื่อปล่อยเจ็ดจุดห้าถ้าอยากได้แปดก็ต้องอยู่ที่แปดจุดห้างงไหมให้เราลบไปศูนย์จุดห้าทุกแบนด์สกิลหมายความว่าถ้าอยู่ expect อยากได้คะแนนจริงแปดอันนี้คุยกันก่อนว่าสมมติเราอยากได้เจ็ดเราก็ต้องอยู่ที่เจ็ดจุดห้าก่อนถูกไหมครับถ้ากับว่าคะแนนมันยังอยู่ที่เจ็ดมันต้องไปลุ้นก็คือแบบลุ้นเอาว่าจะได้เจ็ดจริงหรือเปล่าถูกไหมครับแต่ถ้าเกิดว่า play safe อยู่ที่ประมาณสามสิบห้าถึงสามสิบห้าเออสามสิบสามถึงสามสิบห้ามันจะมีโอกาสได้เจ็ด for sure ทีนี้ถ้าเกิดว่าต้องการเจ็ดจุดห้าแปดเนี่ยก็ต้องอยู่ที่ประมาณสามสิบห้าถึงสามสิบเจ็ดซึ่งพูดง่ายๆคือสามสิบห้าสามเจ็ดมันก็คือแบบเหมือนจับข้อสอบได้แล้วอะ่ะเข้าใจปะ่ะเออนะมันนี้โอเคถ้าอย่างนั้นลองไปรีรันนะครับอันนี้เป็นการจะทำใหม่ก็ได้หรือจะฟังแค่เฉพาะข้อผิดก็ดีโอเคนะแต่ว่าขอรันเทปโซโล่ไปเลย one two three go Test two. You will hear a number of different recordings, and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions, and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four sections. At the end of the test, you will be given 10 minutes to transfer your answers to an answer sheet. Now turn to section one. Section one. You will hear a woman talking to a doctor at a clinic about a medical problem. First. You have some time to look at questions one to four. You will see that there is an example that has been done for you. On this occasion only, the conversation relating to this will be played first. Hi, come and take a seat. Thank you. My name's Carl Rogers, and I'm one of the doctors here at the Total Health Clinic. So I understand this is your first visit to the clinic. Yes, it is. Okay. Well, I hope you'll be very happy with the service you receive here. So, if it's all right with you, I'll take a few details to help me give you the best possible service. Sure. So, can I check first of all that we have the correct personal details for you? So, your full name is Julie Ann Garcia. That's correct. The woman's name is Julie Ann Garcia. So, Garcia has been written in the space. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen. Because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to four. Hi, come and take a seat. Thank you. My name's Carl Rogers, and I'm one of the doctors here at the Total Health Clinic. 
So I understand this is your first visit to the clinic? Yes, it is. Okay. Well, I hope you'll be very happy with the service you receive here. So if it's all right with you, I'll take a few details to help me give you the best possible service. Sure. So can I check, first of all, that we have the correct personal details for you? So your full name is Julie Ann Garcia? That's correct. Perfect. And can I have a contact phone number? It's 219-442-9785. Okay, and then can I just check that we have the correct date of birth? October 10th, 1992. Oh, I actually have 1991. I'll just correct that now. Right, so that's all good. Now I just need a few more personal details. Do you have an occupation, either full-time or part-time? Uh, yes, I work full-time in Esther Hazy's, you know, the restaurant chain. I started off as a waitress there a few years ago, and I'm a manager now. Oh, I know them. Yeah, they're down on 114th Street, aren't they? Uh, that's right. Yeah, I've been there a few times. I just love their salads. Well, that's good to hear. Right, so one more thing I need to know before we talk about why you're here, Julie, and that's the name of your insurance company. It's Cawley Life Insurance. That's C-A-W-L-E-Y. Excellent. Thank you so much. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 5 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 5 to 10. Now, Julie, let's look at how we can help you. So tell me a little about what brought you here today. Well, I've been getting a pain in my knee, the left one. Not very serious at first, but it's gotten worse. So I thought I ought to see someone about it. That's certainly the right decision. So how long have you been aware of this pain? Is it just a few days or is it longer than that? longer. It's been worse for the last couple of days, but it's three weeks since I first noticed it. It came on quite gradually, though, so I kind of ignored it at first. And have you taken any medication yourself or treated it in any way? Um, yeah, I've been taking medication to deal with the pain, Tylenol, and that works okay for a few hours, but I don't like to keep taking it. Okay. And what about heat treatment? Have you tried applying heat at all? No, but I have been using ice on it for the last few days. And does that seem to help the pain at all? A little, yes. Good. Now, you look as if you're quite fit normally. I am, yes. So do you do any sport on a regular basis? Yes, I play a lot of tennis. I belong to a club, so I go there a lot. I'm quite competitive, so I enjoy that side of it as well as the exercise, but I haven't gone since this started. Sure. And do you do any other types of exercise? Uh, yeah, I sometimes do a little swimming, but usually just when I'm on vacation. But normally I go running a few times a week, maybe three or four times. Mm. So your legs are getting quite a pounding, but you haven't had any problems up to now? No, not with my legs. I did have an accident last year when I slipped and hurt my shoulder, but that's better now. Excellent. And do you have any allergies? No, none that I'm aware of. And do you take any medication on a regular basis? Well, I take vitamins, but that's all. I'm generally very healthy. Okay. Well, let's have a closer look and see what might be causing this problem. If you can just get up. That is the end of Section 1. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section two.
Section 2. You will hear a guide talking to a group of tourists who are about to visit an English castle. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. We'll be arriving at Branley Castle in about five minutes. But before we get there, I'll give you a little information about the castle and what our visit will include. So, in fact, there's been a castle on this site for over 1,100 years. The first building was a fort constructed in 914 AD for defence against Danish invaders by King Alfred the Great's daughter, who ruled England at the time. In the following century, after the Normans conquered England, the land was given to a nobleman called Richard de Vere, and he built a castle there that stayed in the de Vere family for over 400 years. However, when Queen Elizabeth I announced that she was going to visit the castle in 1576, it was beginning to look a bit run down. And it was decided that rather than repair the guest rooms, they'd make a new house for her out of wood next to the main hall. She stayed there for four nights and apparently it was very luxurious. But unfortunately, it was destroyed a few years later by fire. In the 17th century, the castle belonged to the wealthy Fennis family who enlarged it and made it more comfortable. However, by 1982, the Fennis family could no longer afford to maintain the castle, even though they received government support, and they put it on the market. It was eventually taken over by a company who owned a number of amusement parks. But when we get there, I think you'll see that they've managed to retain the original atmosphere of the castle. When you go inside, you'll find that in the staterooms, there are lifelike moving wax models dressed in costumes of different periods in the past, which even carry on conversations together. As well as that, in every room, there are booklets giving information about what the room was used for and the history of the objects and furniture it contains. The castle park's quite extensive. At one time, sheep were kept there, and in the 19th century, the owners had a little zoo with animals like rabbits and even a baby elephant. Nowadays, the old zoo buildings are used for public displays of paintings and sculpture. The park also has some beautiful trees, though the oldest of all, which dated back 800 years, was sadly blown down in 1987. Now, you're free to wander around on your own until 4.30, but then, at the end of our visit, we'll all meet together at the bottom of the Great Staircase. We'll then go on to the Long Gallery, where there's a wonderful collection of photographs showing the family who owned the castle a hundred years ago having tea and cakes in the conservatory. And we'll then take you to the same place where afternoon tea will be served to you. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. Now, if you can take a look at your plans, you'll see Branley Castle has four towers joined together by a high wall with the river on two sides. Don't miss seeing the Great Hall. 
That's near the river in the main tower, the biggest one which was extended and redesigned in the 18th century. If you want to get a good view of the whole castle, you can walk around the walls. The starting point's quite near the main entrance. Walk straight down the path until you get to the south gate, and it's just there. Don't go on to the north gate. There's no way up from there. There'll shortly be a show in which you can see archers displaying their skill with a bow and arrow. The quickest way to get there is to take the first left after the main entrance and follow the path past the bridge. Then you'll see it in front of you at the end. If you like animals, there's also a display of hunting birds, falcons and eagles and so on. If you go from the main entrance in the direction of the south gate, but turn right before you get there instead of going through it, you'll see it on your right past the first tower. At 3 p.m., there's a short performance of traditional dancing on the outdoor stage. That's right at the other side of the castle from the entrance and over the bridge. It's about 10 minutes walk or so. And finally, the shop. It's actually inside one of the towers, but the way in is from the outside. Just take the first left after the main entrance, go down the path and take the first right. It's got some lovely gifts and souvenirs. Right, so we're just arriving. That is the end of section two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section three. Section three. You will hear two environmental science students called Rosie and Martin discussing their presentation on an extinct animal called the woolly mammoth with their tutor. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 24. So, Rosie and Martin, let's look at what you've got for your presentation on woolly mammoths. OK, we've got a short outline here. Thanks. Uh, so, it's about a research project in North America. Yes. But we thought we needed something general about woolly mammoths in our introduction to establish that they were related to our modern elephant and they lived thousands of years ago in the last ice age. Maybe we could show a video clip of a cartoon about mammoths, but that'd be a bit childish. Or we could have a diagram. It could be a timeline to show when they lived with illustrations. Or we could just show a drawing of them walking in the ice. No, let's go with your last suggestion. Good. Then you're describing the discovery of the mammoth tooth on St Paul's Island in Alaska and why it was significant. Yes, the tooth was found by a man called Russell Graham. He picked it up from under a rock in a cave. He knew it was special. For a start, it was in really good condition, as if it had been just extracted from the animal's jawbone. Anyway, they found it was 6,500 years old. So why was that significant? 
Well, the mammoth bones previously found on the North American mainland were much less recent than that. So this was really amazing. Then we're making an animated diagram to show the geography of the area in prehistoric times. So originally, St Paul's Island wasn't an island. It was connected to the mainland. And mammoths and other animals, like bears, were able to roam around the whole area. Then the climate warmed up and the sea level began to rise and the island got cut off from the mainland. So those mammoths on the island couldn't escape. They had to stay on the island. And in fact, the species survived there for thousands of years after they'd become extinct on the mainland. So why do you think they died out on the mainland? No one's sure. Anyway, next we'll explain how Graham and his team identified the date when the mammoths became extinct on the island. They concluded that the extinction happened 5,600 years ago, which is a very precise time for a prehistoric extinction. It's based on samples they took from mud at the bottom of a lake on the island. They analysed it to find out what had fallen in over time. Bits of plants, volcanic ash, and even DNA from the mammoths themselves. It's standard procedure, but it took nearly two years to do. Before you hear the rest of the discussion, you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 25 to 30. So why don't you quickly go through the main sections of your presentation and discuss what actions needed for each part? OK, so for the introduction, we're using a visual. So once we've prepared that, we're done. I'm not sure. I think we need to write down all the ideas we want to include here. Not just rely on memory. How we begin the presentation is so important. Mm, you're right. The discovery of the mammoth tooth is probably the most dramatic part, but we don't have that much information, only what we got from the online article. I thought maybe we could get in touch with the researcher who led the team and ask him to tell us a bit more. Great idea. What about the section with the initial questions asked by the researchers? We've got a lot on that, but we need to make it interesting. We could ask the audience to suggest some questions about it and then see how many of them we can answer. I don't think it would take too long. Yes, that would add a bit of variety. Then the section on further research carried out on the island, analysing the mud in the lake. I wonder if we've actually got too much information here. Should we cut some? I don't think so, but it's all a bit muddled at present. Yes, maybe it would be better if it followed a chronological pattern. I think so. The findings and possible explanations section is just about ready, but we need to practice it so we're sure it won't overrun. I think it should be OK, but yes, <laughs> let's make sure. Hmm. In the last section, relevance to the present day, you've got some good ideas, but this is where you need to move away from the ideas of others and give your own viewpoint. OK, we'll think about that. Now, shall we show you some of the... That is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
now turn to section 4. Section 4. You will hear a lecture about the history of weather forecasting. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. In this series of lectures about the history of weather forecasting, I'll start by examining its early history. That'll be the subject of today's talk. OK, so we'll start by going back thousands of years. Most ancient cultures had weather gods, and weather catastrophes, such as floods, played an important role in many creation myths. Generally, weather was attributed to the whims of the gods, as the wide range of weather gods in various cultures shows. For instance, there's the Egyptian sun god Ra, and Thor, the Norse god of thunder and lightning, Many ancient civilizations developed rites such as dances in order to make the weather gods look kindly on them. But the weather was of daily importance. Observing the skies and drawing the correct conclusions from these observations was really important. In fact, their survival depended on it. It isn't known when people first started to observe the skies, but at around 650 BC, the Babylonians produced the first short-range weather forecasts based on their observations of clouds and other phenomena. The Chinese also recognized weather patterns, and by 300 BC, astronomers had developed a calendar which divided the year into 24 festivals, each associated with a different weather phenomenon. The ancient Greeks were the first to develop a more scientific approach to explaining the weather. The work of the philosopher and scientist Aristotle in the 4th century BC is especially noteworthy as his ideas held sway for nearly 2,000 years. In 340 BC, he wrote a book in which he attempted to account for the formation of rain, clouds, wind, and storms. He also described celestial phenomena such as halos, that is, bright circles of light around the sun, the moon, and bright stars, and comets. Many of his observations were surprisingly accurate. For example, he believed that heat could cause water to evaporate, but he also jumped to quite a few wrong conclusions, such as that winds are breathed out by the earth. Errors like this were rectified from the Renaissance onwards. For nearly 2,000 years, Aristotle's work was accepted as the chief authority on weather theory. Alongside this, though, in the Middle Ages, weather observations were passed on in the form of proverbs, such as red sky at night, shepherd's delight, red sky in the morning, shepherd's warning. 
Many of these are based on very good observations and are accurate, as contemporary meteorologists have discovered. For centuries, any attempt to forecast the weather could only be based on personal observations. But in the 15th century, scientists began to see the need for instruments. Until then, the only ones available were weather vanes to determine the wind direction and early versions of rain gauges. One of the first, invented in the 15th century, was a hygrometer which measured humidity. This was one of many inventions that contributed to the development of weather forecasting. In 1592, the Italian scientist and inventor Galileo developed the world's first thermometer. His student Torricelli later invented the barometer, which allowed people to measure atmospheric pressure. In 1648, the French philosopher Pascal proved that pressure decreases with altitude. This discovery was verified by English astronomer Halley in 1686, and Halley was also the first person to map trade winds. This increasing ability to measure factors related to weather helped scientists to understand the atmosphere and its processes better, and they started collecting weather observation data systematically. In the 18th century, the scientist and politician Benjamin Franklin carried out work on electricity and lightning in particular, but he was also very interested in weather and studied it throughout most of his life. It was Franklin who discovered that storms generally travel from west to east. In addition to new meteorological instruments, other developments contributed to our understanding of the atmosphere. People in different locations began to keep records, and in the mid-19th century, the invention of the telegraph made it possible for these records to be collated. This led by the end of the 19th century, to the first weather services. It was not until the early 20th century that mathematics and physics became part of meteorology. And we'll continue from that point next week. That is the end of section four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. เดี๋ยวเราตรวจดูไต่พาร์ทว่าพาร์ทสองคือไอ้พาร์ทสองครับโดนแต่ว่าโดนแบบคะแนนมันตกล่วงลงลงพาร์ทนั้นเยอะส
้ได้อยู่วิธีการก็คือพอเราเรียนเช็คเนี่ยถ้าเราอยากจะเรียนเช็คแบบอ่านแคสต์คริปก็ได้นะครับหรือเปิดซีซีง่ายกว่าใช่นะฮะจะได้ไม่ต้องไปอ่านแคสต์คริปละเพราะเปิดซีซีมันก็จะขึ้นรันอยู่แล้วนะแต่ว่า recommend ก็แล้วแต่แล้วแต่แตสไตล์และการบางคนอาจจะไม่ชอบที่จะทําก็สอบซ้ําๆแต่ในมุมพี่พี่มองว่าสมมุติครั้งที่หนึ่งทำไปแล้วเนี่ยให้ทำใหม่เป็นครั้งที่สองโดยไม่จำเป็นต้องดูเทปสคริปต์งงปะหมายถึงว่าสมมุติครั้งที่หนึ่งได้คะแนนสกอร์ออกมาแล้วเนี่ยครั้งที่สองก็ตั้งใจทำใหม่อีกรอบหนึ่งเหมือนเราสอบจริงอ่ะเพราะในวันวัน,วนที่เราสอบจริงเราจะไม่เราจะไม่สามารถดูเทปสคริปต์ได้เลยถูกไหมอ่าแต่พี่หนูว่าในเวลของการดึงความเข้าใจหรือว่าเช็คว่าทำไหนเป็นทำไหนเนี่ยอาจจะต้องดูเทปสคริปต์นะครับหมายถึงว่าต้องดู CC ไปในส่วนของ listening ถ้ากิดว่าต้องการแบนแบบเต็มนะเป็น full option นะก็ต้องได้เต็มหละ 8.5 ไหม listening ผมเคยได้บ้าง8นะครับ listening ครับ8 8คือ35ถูกไหมใช่ครับมไม่น่าผมไปฟังในในไอ้นี่ครับไอ้ของของแคมบิดนะครับแต่ว่าเป็นของเล่มเต็มสี่เทสที่น่าจะเทสที่สามครับที่ได้แปดแล้วลองทําค่าเฉลี่ยสิมันถึงว่าทําไปกี่ชุดอะถึงสิบชุดได้ยังทำถ้าให้ได้สิบชุดนะมันก็จะได้มันจะได้เคาะออกมาเป็นค่าเฉลี่ยแต่ถ้าต่ำกว่าสิบชุดยังไม่ต้องไปลุ้นค่าเฉลี่ยเองเช่นเอาครั้งที่หนึ่งไล่ไล่ยาไปเลยถึงครั้งที่สิบแล้วก็หารหาค่าเฉลี่ยออกมามันก็จะออกเป็นแบนที่เราพอทำได้ในวันข้อสอบงงปะหมายถึงว่าอยู่ทำแค่สองรอบเนี่ยไม่ต้องไปหาค่าเฉลี่ยเพราะมันไม่มีหรือห้าครั้งก็ถือว่าไม่ไม่หาค่าเฉลี่ยไม่ได้แต่ว่าต้องต้องเอ่อต้องทำประมาณสักสิบครั้งหมายถึงว่าสิบชุดของข้อสอบใช่จำได้ว่าผมทำไปผมทำเทสที่สิบหกไปแล้วสี่สี่ชุดครับแล้วก็สิบห้าทำไปแล้วไอ้สี่ชุดแล้วก็เป็นแปดไอเทสสี่ก็ทำเทสสี่สามสองนะครับก็ประมาณก็น่าจะเกินสิบแล้วก็เป็นสิบสิบเอ็ดแล้วเออสิบเอ็ดชุดแล้วก็ลองเอาเฉลี่ยได้นะครับอืมและสุดเอาคะแนนรวมกันนะแล้วก็หารสิบเอ็ดยากไหมไม่ยากนะว่า reading writing ยากสุดแล้ว reading ก็ยากแต่ว่า reading ก็เป็นถ้าเกิดว่าเราเป็นทรง academic มันก็ไม่มีปัญหา writing ยากสุดเอาง่ายๆคือเอ่อเวลาเขียนมาก็ impressive เป็นเป็นงานเขียนที่ที่ค่อนข้างดีที่สุดนะครับแต่ว่าพี่เคยสอนเด็ก intern เนี่ยเขียนดีกว่าเราอะแต่ออกมาเป็น 6.5 surprise ไหมหมายความว่าเขาเขียนเขาเขียนได้ดีแบบ structure ทุกอย่างแบบ hit แล้วก็ meaningful sentence แต่ว่าพอเราไปไปสอบเนี่ยเหมือนแบบเขาต้อง handle หน้างานเองอ่ะเหมือนพอเราเขาอยู่กับเราอ่ะเขา performance ดีแต่ว่าพอเราไปสอบเองเขาอาจจะ drop down นึกภาพไหมอืมเพราะฉะนั้นเนี่ยเอ่อหน้าวันนี้เนี่ย writing ค่อยว่า writing ต้อง text time นิดนึงนะถ้าเกิดว่าเราแบบไม่เลือกที่จะ text time เลยเนี่ยก็ไม่ต้องไปสอบนะเพราะมันไม่ได้ไม่เขาว่าไปดูว่ามันก็จะออกมาเป็น common ทั่วไปที่เด็กๆส่วนใหญ่ไปสอบเนี่ยก็จะเป็น 5.56 ซึ่งก็มาเคลมว่าตัวเองเขียนดีแล้วแต่เอาจริงๆแล้วเนี่ยไม่ต้องไป blame i e l s ครับเพราะว่าเขาจัดตาม performance จริงๆเข้าใจไหมหมายถึงว่าสมมติว่าบางคนมันจะมีบางคนไปสอบปุ๊บเฮ้ยอยากได้คะแนนสูงกว่านี้ในขณะที่พอคะแนนที่มันโชว์อ่ะมันคือ performance ของเขาเออพี่อาจจะพูดตรงนิดนึงแต่จริงๆแล้วมันพูดอย่างนั้นไม่ได้ใช่ไหมก็ต้องให้กำลังใจไปก่อนโอเคปะเออนะประมาณนั้นไม่ต้องวอร์รี่อ่านะครับทีนี้เดี๋ยวพี่ขอตัดไปทำพี่ขอเบรกก่อน5นาทีให้ผมเลือก speaking ก่อนนะฮะแป๊บหนึ่งนะยูให้ยูเลือก speaking ครับผมมี art close Education. เราพูดอะไรไปบ้างแล้ว Family, Food, Health, Internet, Nature, Society, Travel. Travel ไหม Travel พูดยัง
จำไม่ได้ครับเหมือนจะยังปะไม่แน่ใจน่าจะยังไม่เคยได้ยินนะถูกปะมีมีหัวข้อไหมครับเนี่ยหัวข้ออาร์ตอาร์ตไหมหันลินไม่รู้เด็ดไม่รู้จะพูดอะไรแล้ว close ปะ fashion เป็นออกแนวแฟชั่นนะพาราดิสกาชะไม่ใช่มานั่งแบบว่าสวมเสื้อสีอะไรไม่ใช่นะ traditional clothes กับ fashionable trend อะไรอย่างเงี้ยฟิลนั้นมากกว่าหรือไม่ก็แบบว่ายูนิฟอร์มยูนิฟอร์มโอเคไหมงั้นล็อกหกข้อต้องพูดคนเดียวนะวันนี้หกข้อหกข้อเลยนะแต่ว่าพูดยาวๆเยอะๆใช่ปะนะครับงั้นไอขอให้ยูเลือกตัวที่ยูอยากจะพูดก่อนสามข้อสามในหกก่อนแต่วันนี้เราจะทำหกข้อด้วยกันโอเคอันนี้ไอเบรกก่อนห้านาทีนะเลือกมาเดี๋ยวค่อยว่ากัน
ป็นไงบ้างได้ไหมครับผมว่าเลือกข้อไหนครับผมล็อกข้ออ่าข้อสองนะครับแล้วก็อืมข้อสองถูกครับ Why some companies ข้อสองแล้วก็ข้อข้อสามครับแล้วก็สามแล้วก็ข้อข้อหนึ่งนะครับหนึ่งสองอันนี้ต้องต้องพูดกี่นาทีครับบอกว่าข้อสองนาทีเหรอครับรู้ไหมข้อสองนาทีใช่ได้ปะข้อละสองนาทีอาจารย์จะมีบางข้อเกินสองนาทีอาจารย์จะมีบางข้อเดียวไม่เกินไม่เป็นไรไม่ต้องเวอรี่นะครับพูดเยอะๆก่อนเพราะว่าดึง fluency คําว่า fluency คือก็พูดเยอะอะครับพูดเยอะแล้วก็พูดคล่องถูกไหมครับ alright so shall we start for the first question here can closing tell you much about a person Um, personally, I believe that clothing uh, tells um, about per, um, each person's personality a lot. Uh, for example, um, if if you say someone who uh, are more who is more likely to show off their own richness or poorness, you know, um, we we can see in in reality that a uh, lots of um, Rich workers or entrepreneur that uh, wear a suit, uh, or um, some girls or teenagers who always afford for luxurious um, skirts or shirts, something like that, to follow the um, the trends of, I mean, the new trends or latest trends of the fashion. So um, that's and also we can describe um, these kind of people as the uh, material. Listic people, yeah. But um, in an, in um, in another case, we can see um uh, some people who who are not that rich, but um they they are more likely to save their money. They don't spend a lot of money on uh buying something like it's it's a, it's a waste of money, right? So they don't use a lot of money to buy. Um, the expensive clothes, yeah, but they rather they rather use their own money for the uh, emergency in the future, yeah, or something that useful. That's it. All right. Um, so second question here: Why do some companies? Ask their staff to wear uniforms. Um, first of all, most of companies ask their staff to wear uniform too. Um, the first reason is to uh, make them stand out. You know, make those uh, staff to to be noticeable in the society. Um, for example, if you're a police and if you wear a uniform, um, if uh, if some people. Get injured, or if some people are in the trouble, so they can uh, consult you, or you know they can come up to you because uh, they see that you wear uniform police, right? So they, so you will be able to help them. And um, also, um, uniforms make workers to be proud um, at their work. Uh, for example, if you um, if you work at the office, or if you are are a manager, if you and Um, you're forced by your boss to 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 wear a suit, so that uh, so that shows you um, the status of work as well that you are a manager, yeah, and you're prosperous in your life. You are successful in your life. You get a high salary, and um, you look like a um a, a white collar worker, yeah. Uh, next question is that um, what are the advantages and disadvantages of having uniforms at work? Um, first of all, I I will start with the advantages of wearing uniforms at work. So um, I believe that a lot of people, uh, some people, I, I would say that some people who um 
cannot decide what to wear to their uh what to wear and to, and also go to their workplace so there is no any um difficult decision for them because um if they are ordered to wear a uniform by their boss so um every day they go to work they just um only choose one uh one type of cloth which is their own uniform yeah uh, and additionally, there is the disadvantage of wearing uniforms at work as well. Mm, it's, you know, uh, some, it's, um, I, I would say that wearing uniforms can deep, depersonalize uh, people, including students or um, young teenagers. Yeah. And um, it doesn't um, show their own personality. You know, uh, they cannot apply uh, the clothing in your life, uh, in, your, in their lifestyle of fashion as well. If they uh, usually wear the uniforms to, uh, in order to go to work. See, right. moving to next question here and question number four, right? When do people wear traditional clothes to a new country? Um, Mostly, I say people wear traditional clo clothes um, in the important uh, festival, or sometimes they wear um, a traditional cloth and um, as, uh, in, uh, I would say, as a celebration of Thailand. Uh, for example, uh, Song, Song Grand Day. Yeah, it will, uh, most of people wear. Uh, casual shirts they they don't you know wear a suit or um like you, you know they they don't make themselves so dapper yeah um and also most of the clothes are like um have uh, are plain and also uh it can it contains the um colorful flowers on the shirt to, um, to show that um, this is the importance of um, this day, some grand day, some grand day, yeah. Our uh -huh. So next question is that, um, okay. how have clothes, um, clothes of fashions changed in your country over the last few decades? Mm, um, to be honest, over the last decades, uh, Thai people are frequently influenced by the Western uh, fashion. I would say I would say that, such as um, Channel or Gucci, you know, Gucci belt, right? Or a shirt, you know, and the, and those. Uh, clothes are so expensive, but um, you know, th um, currently Thai people uh, tend to buy those clothes to follow the, uh, the latest trend. Mm. Of uh, I, I would say that it's a global trend of fashion. Yeah, and um, nowadays Thai people don't uh, wear in the traditional traditional clothes anymore. Like uh, what other people in the period, pe uh, previous generation, wore? Yeah. See, okay, good. And the last question to you is that um, what is the difference between clothes that young people and old people like to wear? Um, it's it's um quite considerable that there is a difference between. Uh, young people and old people wearing clothes. Uh, um, I was I would start with the decision of wearing clothes in in uh, daily life between young people and old. I mean elderly people. Um, in reality, most of young people wear um, expensive clothes, and I um, usually afford for you know luxurious clothes, and they do that because. Um, you know, te teenagers, they um, want to go outside with their friends, hang out with their friends, or they usually go to the party. They, they, uh, it's, uh, it's the age of having fun. 
and um, they want to show their own lifestyle or their personality, show to this, show to the world, and now so yeah, follow the uh, follow the trend of fashion. But uh, if we, but if we say about old people, old people don't tend to wear uh, some kinds of clothes like that. They they just um, and they have the decisions of wearing clothes. Um, you know, they, they just randomly uh, wear clothes in their daily life because um, this is not their priority of um, their routine. Yeah, old people. And um, as in a so far, old people tend to um, drink of coffee at, uh, in the morning and, you know, read some newspapers. This is their routine in their life. Or some people who are retired already, they just um, sleep at home. They they um, they don't uh, frequently go. Out. Um, I I would say that they are not outgoing and they are not sociable like teenagers. Yeah, they are more likely to stay at home. So that's um, why they. So that's the difference between uh, wearing clothes uh, of young people and old people. Mm. So do you think um, like a fashion industry has impact to a young generation? Ah, yes, of course. Mm -hmm. it's, um, it's in uh, the fashion industry influences um, young people a lot and it has influenced young people for, a, for I'm, I think it, it's probably 10, 10 years or 20 years, I would say like that. Because uh, as, um, as you say, like, also, my uh, my friend, um, she's a she is a young girl as well. She's his her age is just seventeen, the same as me as well. But um, you know she, uh, what she likes to buy, what she, what she um, she what she has been influenced by um, those fashion industry as well. Um, I mean, she loves to um, buy expensive clothes. Yeah, and wear wear them, and then po um take a picture, and then uh, post on Instagram or something like that. Yeah, mm -hmm. I see. So maybe lots of teenager or maybe young girls or young boys are inclined to a um fashionable trend, or even um fashion has um you know immensely impact to what people lifestyle during this day, right? So um according to the news, which has uh, happened to uh, let's say like criminal to what um how how someone wear clothes it might not expose I mean it's not that a closure it's exposed to something that may be attractive um to lead someone do harm to their body for example like sexual harassment things like that so do you think clothing affect people behavior in that way. Um, it depends on some people, yeah. Uh, for example, uh, we can say like mm, the most of most of young girls who come from the countryside, and uh, most of them are not um, well supervised by their parents, right? And you know they're they're influenced by the these uh, fashion industry, so they they just uh, make you, you know they de independently make their own decision of wearing uh, anything. So when, when, uh, for example, when they, when they go to the party, they just, um, they just don't care or they're not attentive to what they wear. They just, they, they, or they are, are more inclined to wear a short or like I would say like that. It's, uh, it's nearly, in, it's nearly nude, nudie, yeah, I would say. That and you know it it, it attracts um, men or strangers a lot to harm themselves, mm. or I would say that um, rape, raping, yeah. So, okay, so um, recently we've been knowing that some people may be uh, maybe rejected the way that a school uniform should be wearing. Um, for a student just because it's all about like, um, you know, 
liberal, um, let's say, the like freedom of um, you know choices, right? A choice of freedom, things like that. Also, some student may not want to wear such a school uniform. So, what do you think about this issue? Do you think is it good or is it bad? Um, personally, I believe that everything has um, pros and cons. But I was, uh, but as your, uh, but according to your question, you asked me like that. Uh, I will. I, I explain the disadvantages of uh, this first. So, uh, firstly, I will start with um, discomfort, and you, you know, all um, student stance feel like um, comfortable when they're wear. I, I mean, some people. I mean, some students don't feel comfortable to wear uh, uniforms. Yeah, because and uh, most of them think that it's um, unnecessary to wear uniforms to, to go to school because, you know, um, uh, because we, we can see that it doesn't affect um, students' academic performance, right? Yeah. Uh, we, and the purpose of going to school is just uh, to study and also being literate and uh, just listen to the teacher, listen to the lecturer or, you know, doing your homework and also doing an exam something like that but and it's um it, it doesn't make sense that uniforms um affect their um their academic performance here yeah. and even it doesn't reduce their their um grades or scores in their exams i see but, but some people say that oh sorry um just I'm thinking about the reality of uh, lots of students wearing as different clothes, colorful clothes or whatever they want to wear and then go to school. It might be a lot of att attracted to other people, let's say like, uh, just because um, it is kind of like a social setting might be a different too, just because to those students who are coming from like wealthy or a good financial status, right? They're gonna have like fashion trend to um, you know, to, to go to school and wearing what they want to wear. But for those students who might be different in that, so they're going to have like, uh, say, like um, inferior, inferior of themselves, you know what I mean? I mean, um, it's just like uh, they, they don't have enough of, um, you know, an opportunity to wearing such like uh, other people to wear when it comes to like uh, wearing whatever you want to wear. So do you think um, is it okay that everyone can wear and then go to school for this? Do you understand this? I I I want to say, suit or wear, or if they wear something that is not uniform, that is different from others, that is going to make other people feel uncomfortable. And then they will say, "What is it?" Yes, yes, yes. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, um, it's not the main factor that we that, that we uh, that every teachers or every adult should consider you know? uh, because there it uh, this is not the um, the one factor that attracts or attracts students or um, destroy the, their life no uh, and it's not a main factor so in my opinion or according to psychological um, research so we should encourage these students to avoid taking drugs or doing something harmful to other people instead. Mm -hmm. You know, it, uh, it, it doesn't make sense if uh, we say that you should wear uniforms and that's gonna uh, make a better student or prospect, or uh, I would say make them more prosperous and, you know, and, it, you know, it, it doesn't make, if, if, we, if we say like that, it doesn't make them uh, mature. I see. So maybe a different perspective that uh, we're going to focus on their academic achievement instead of wearing something and then go to school, right? Okay, so uh, yeah, yeah, I do agree with that. Um, okay, good. Nice to hear from you. But anyway, I like uh, wearing a different clothes and then you have to sit in a single classroom. So imagine that is I'm a teacher, I can see that a lot of students have a wonderful 
closest in front of my eye, right? So it might a little bit attracting to see something that is just because the maybe a student may pay attention to that their peers or their friends instead instead of like uh, going to focus on their um, teaching stuff or even the pay attention to the classroom at all, right? And for some reasons, I would say that um, um, it's been controversial just because if, if uh, so every student have to wear whatever they want to wear and then they go to school, it might have like a little bit um, inequality in terms of like um, some student may go in a different from a, a family uh, setting. You know what I mean? Just because like some people may gonna have like lots of um, colorful or even their fashion clothes or style that they're gonna wear, but some people may don't have anything to wear, just only for school uniform. So this might be a little bit, um, you know, inequality in this way. So I think it might be more discussed and more, um, you know, action plan toward this issue again, just because it's not that finalized yet and how will students should wear just only uniform or even wearing what they want to wear. Is that right? Good. <laughs> what who are you? What am I? Okay. Nah, for me, and you can ชุดสดมันจะมันกว่าใช่มันจะเป็นแบบดิสเคสแต่ว่าพี่ก็ต้องพยายามดึงตัวที่เป็นเทรนดิ้งนิดนึงคือถ้าเป็นถ้าเป
uh, when it comes to choosing a job. Uh, first of all, I, I will start with when people uh, are applying for their jobs. Um, it's it's more significant for people to choose um, a job on, uh, in the purpose of their motivation and also they, they really like it. It's um, or those jobs are involved or related to their passion. I would say that it is more important than um, expecting for a high salary. Um, for example, I will explain uh, some situations. It's a real situation that can um, support this statement. Yeah. So, uh, for example, mm, like my, uh, he, he's uh, he's the friend of my mother, and um, when he was a child. Or when he he was a teen, I I cannot remember it exactly. When he was around seventeen or eighteen years old, he had an expectation to um, be an engineer. He you know he anticipated to do this job, and you know he was inspired by a lot of successful people. But uh, when he was at uh, when his age was around uh, eighteen years old, uh, his parents told him to, um, to, to do some jobs that um, he can get a high salary. You know, uh, or in other words, I would say that he was forced to do um, another job that, that was not engineering. He, um, as, I've, as I've done so far, he was forced um, and you know, he, 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 he was, um, I, I would say that his personality was uh, really strange and um, it's it's really different from other people. Um, even though he's an outgoing people and he's also sociable, but um, he was, but when he was at, uh, I, I would say he, when he was 18, he was really subservient and obedient to his parents. So, um, I mean, everything that his parents told him to do, he, he would follow everything or he would obey everything, yeah. So yeah, and the job that he currently does right now is um, a doctor. Yeah, so he's a doctor. Mm -hmm. um, actually, I, I asked him that, um, do, do you get a high, high salary when you're a doctor? And he said, yeah, he gets a high salary. He's successful. He can buy a car, you know, a luxurious car, some expensive stops to, um, and also to bring these or you know, to bring some expensive souvenirs to his parents, and to, you know, his parents are so proud of him. Um, I would say that uh, nowadays his parents feel a vicarious excitement or pride. Yeah, I mean, a vicarious pride. Yeah. I see. Um, he said that, um, but yeah, he, he said that he's uh, sometimes he's a little bit un uh, depressed and uh, a little bit um, unhappy. Or I would say that um, he doesn't go. He doesn't want to go to work every day. Um, every day he wake up in the morning. He 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 reluctantly um, um, eats breakfast and then just go outside to his workplace because um, he said that even though he gets a high salary or he's is popular, I, I mean the most popular person in the village, or in um or around you know, his hometown, but he said, he, he, he said to me that he's unhappy in a way. Yeah. Because um, that's, um, that's not what he wants. Uh, sorry, he, that's not what he wanted to do when he was a child. And he wasn't, he wasn't motivated to, um, to do this job. Yeah. I see. All right. Um, so what do you think about like a people need to choose a job just because of people. I mean, um, some people may take any priority that they're gonna do a job just because it serves their satisfaction or expectation in a later life, is that right? But when it comes to reality, some kind of job depend on people you work with, for example, like some company, if you have, you, you have lots of uh, co-workers that, that, that um, do not help you or assist you 
or did not drive you to go in the same expectation? Is this kind of a problem to do so? I mean, lots of people may uh, resign from a job just because of people, right? So to what extent do you think people in the workplace has much more influence to what people, to what, what we should uh, choose a job or place to fall for? Um, yeah, yeah, I, I would say in that way, it, it, uh, it's, a po it's possibly, I mean, it's pro possibly true. And it also depends on each, peop uh, each person as well. But um, it affects these kind of people a lot uh, when, when, when they should, um, uh, I would say that when they must work with um, those people that they dislike, I mean, um, you know, work in groups and uh, the members in groups are quite feckless or lazy, I, I would say like that. That uh, affects their life um, at their workplace a lot. Yeah, if they uh, if they if their members in their groups don't encourage or don't or are not helpful enough, yeah. Mm -hmm. So it means or that it's not teamwork. Yeah, people has a big effect to what people working, right? Okay, good. That's it. Uh huh. So do you think? Do you think? Um. So some people say that um just because job or career progress might go beyond than our uh, quality, life, quality of life or work-life balance. For example, like to those people who uh, run a business or being in a position of manager or they have to be uh, massive responsible for lots of things, right? So it can be said that um, work-life balance work-life balance might be decreasing to those people who have a higher position or a level of executive like that. Do you agree or disagree with that? บอกว่าไม่มีไลฟ์บาลานซ์ในว่าพวกที่เขาอยู่นั่นส่งก็คือเขาอาจจะไม่มีเวลาแล้วคุณจะใช้ตามงานหนักกว่าคนอื่นน
Uh, the reason that I said that because you know uh, um, the blue collar workers they just um, use their uh, physical uh, physical skills. I mean, uh, lifting heavy things or carrying um, big stones, and then you know, yeah, uh, building the um, you know, they, they're working in the construction, right? They're building something, yeah. They, they, and you know, it uh, affects just their own physical condition. Or sometimes they get stronger because uh, it's um, it's like they automatically uh, work. Okay, so for, doing exercise. Yeah. <laughs> so skip pain, right? Okay. Yeah. Good. Mm -hmm. But to those managers, they are gonna have to accept that equality. Um, I mean, I mean, work-life balance might not raised to their expectation. I I would say to me, I'm not saying that I'm a kind of um, the one who can run any kind of a business, but I I used to be like, uh, just because once um, those people who aim high or set a higher expectation for their, li for their life or even a career path, career progress, so they're gonna put effort or take effort a lot more than other people. So it seemed to me that um, I have to think that work-life balance doesn't exist in reality of those people who have a higher position in that way. Just because in reality, it's kind of, if you want to live a life with a life of a perfect life, you need to commit to working. Is that right? So it means that life and work must come along to each other. You, can, you cannot say that you have a life without work. Is that right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, that, yeah. So this is this kind of thing, like um, maybe debatable or discussion topic. But I would say that I can see lots of uh, some of my friends who um pause it for executive or entrepreneur or run any kind of business. They're gonna have to commit themselves into that work, and they have to be sacrifices, or even they have to know themselves that they're gonna reach it just because it's all about their expectation. So any kind of uh, people um, who think that they're going to risk, the, I just want to work life well and I don't want to uh, take effort in that work much, it's fine. But in return, you cannot expect the big things more than just um, go into the role or like operation, operation system that you have to work in a daily way. Is that right? Mm. That's it. From my nan, they have horse. Look, my lawyers, look, we มันแต่ว่าเตรียมผมยังมีอีกทีละพูดเยอะครับเพราะว่าจริงเหรอเดี๋ยวค่อยมาพูดพรุ่งนี้ดีกว่าพี่กินข้าวก่อนดีกว่